Our God is still on his throne and ruling the affairs of man. Even as he does not change, his truths have not changed. Thankfully, God still has a people which proclaim that old time religion setting forth his sovereignty and the old paths of truth where we can find rest for our souls. Welcome to Word of Sovereign Grace, a ministry of Paradise Primitive Baptist Church in Arlington, Texas. Get your Bible, call your friends, and sit back as we open the King James Scriptures to explore the glorious word of sovereign grace. Here's this week's message. Indeed, I continue to make an interest in your prayers as I try to stand before you this morning. I came to help lead singing, didn't get to do that, so um, your two-minute warning was a little bit of a surprise. I want to take a verse this morning, if I can, out of the, the book of uh, 1 Timothy, but uh, I'd like to read in order to get the context, if I could, in the, uh, the first chapter of 1 Timothy, begins like this, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope, unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine, <clears throat> neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions, <clears throat> rather than godly edifying which is in faith, so do. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and out of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned, from which some, having swerved, have turned aside into vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whether they are firm. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men-stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for he hath counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a prosecutor, a persecutor, and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. This is a verse I was trying to get down to. This is a verse that I'd like to examine a little bit this morning and uh, consider if the Lord will allow. It says, How be it for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering." for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. This tells me, if I understand what I'm reading, that Paul the Apostle is a pattern to those that are come to the knowledge of the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ and learn something in this. So we ought to look at the, the pattern that Paul is in the scriptures if we can. We've got a, quite a few controversies among us. Uh, if you're a Bible student at some time or another, you're going to have a uh, a question of, of controversy, uh, asking questions about Adam. Was he was he born again? Was he restored to, to his condition? Uh, uh, questions about Christ. Did he uh, ascend on the on the morning of the resurrection? The, <clears throat> when he first came out of the grave, or was it 40 days later? Uh, was Judas a child of God? And was Paul born again on the road to Damascus, or was he just converted? And <clears throat> I want to examine, I guess, the, the last one. I'm not going to solve any of these controversies for you, and I hope perhaps that uh, we might look at them uh, with a little different light. We don't uh, get to see Paul in the New Testament until the seventh chapter of the book of Acts. So let's go over there. This is uh, where Paul is standing as Stephen is giving this strong testimony in this history of, of the Jewish nation. Uh, Stephen was a deacon, one of, the, one of the seven that were selected, and he's given a strong testimony, and they're about to, uh, to stone Stephen to death. And Paul shows up in, in the 58th verse, um, where it says, uh, in 57 it says, And they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. 
And the witnesses laid down the clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. We get this <clears throat> written testimony from Luke, who wrote the book of Acts. Luke traveled with and was an associate of Paul. You see over, I think, in the 21st, 22nd chapter, talks about uh, when we were uh, with Paul's company, we went in uh, to the house of, of Philip, who was one of the seven. So you, you tie Philip and Paul and Luke all together in, in that verse. So uh, we've got a reliable eyewitness of the things that took place here. Uh, Paul shows up the, for the first time in the seventh chapter, but we have to wonder, given Paul's credentials and giving Paul's uh, description of himself, if perhaps he might have been in Jerusalem at the time that the Lord was crucified. Paul was a devout Jew. Paul was a Pharisee of Pharisees, he, he calls himself, I think, in, in uh, Philippians, in the, in the third chapter. And later in Acts, he, calls it, he describes himself as a Pharisee and the son of a Pharisee. So Paul has a longstanding tradition among the Jews. And I suspect that... Uh, as a religious and devout Jew, that he would have appeared in Jerusalem, as was required by the law three times a year. Uh, whether he lived in Tarsus and, and uh, Tarsus, and some say that he had a home in Tarsus and that he also had a home in Jerusalem. I don't know if that's the case or not. But I tend to think that Paul, who was zealous and wanting to defend the law and defend the tradition of the fathers and to, to defend the Jewish way of life as strongly as he did, might have been at or near the crucifixion at the time that these things were taking place when Jesus was put to death. So we go over into the ninth chapter when we begin to read a little bit about Saul. After after that first mention, we find him in Acts chapter 9, and it says, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughterings against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound into Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined, shined round about him a light from heaven. He's about to go through some very difficult things here, and uh, a great transformation. This is one of the debates that's going to come up, and, and it's been discussed, and he probably... If, if you're a good Bible student, you've been on both sides of this. Uh, you say that Paul was born again on the road to Damascus, uh, and then at, at another time you say, no, he was just converted. I'm not going to answer that for you this morning. I don't think I can. But one of the things I, I do want to point out to you that in our pattern and the things that we look for in the life of Paul, one of the things that we see is that Paul stood <clears throat> by Stephen and heard probably the, the second best preaching that had been available to that time. He had heard, uh, he, he probably didn't hear the, Peter on the day of, a, uh, of Pentecost preach. He probably wasn't uh, in that crowd, but we know he was in this crowd, and we heard Stephen give a, a stirring testimony of the history of the Jews and the things that God had done and the things that God had aligned in order to bring about uh, that which was necessary to bring Christ in, in, into this world in order to, to save his people. And if there was ever a sermon that was uh, charged and filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, certainly the, the what Stephen uh, said on that day was. And you can read that, and if you want a short history of everything that happened from Adam all the, the way up until uh, the time that, that Christ came, and from a Jewish perspective, uh, Stephen tells you. He tells you in a shortcutted version. But what I want to point out to you this morning is that the Apostle Paul heard the gospel. And if the gospel is necessary to bring a person to life, to bring about the new birth, then it failed right here. Uh, it failed. <clears throat> uh, Paul heard a very stirring gospel there, and it didn't bring him to life. It just made him mad. It right. made him angry. It confirmed that he was an enemy. Now, we go over to the fifth chapter. I think it's the fifth chapter of the book of Romans, and it talks about how Christ died for us while we were yet enemies. And uh, uh, Paul is certainly in our pattern. He's the enemy. Uh, you can't be any more of an enemy than the Apostle Paul is in order uh, to the gospel uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there, shone, there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? 
And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. It's hard for thee to swim upstream. It's hard for thee to go against the tide. You've got to... Uh, the Lord spoke in terms that they understood in the time. And when he says that it's hard for thee to kick against the pricks, my understanding of that and what I've studied on it is that uh, he's making reference to uh, something called an ox code. Now, ox code is only mentioned one other time, or one time at all in the, in the scriptures. It's over in the book of Judges where a man slew uh, 600 men with an ox code. But the one that... that I understand it's it's like a modern day what we would call a modern day cattle prod. It was a long stick that had spikes on one end of it, and the spikes would be pushed up against the back of the calf uh, of the uh, cattle or the ox, so that they couldn't back up and they couldn't kick. It's impossible to kick back, and they had to keep moving forward. So this is a, the expression here. It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what will thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what to do. Uh, later on, you get another description. Uh, Paul tells this story, I think, three times through the book of Acts. It's recorded once in his uh, defense to King Agrippa and, and Felix. And uh, at, at that point, I think there's a reference there that says that he's put onto the street called Straight. So the Lord takes you and puts you on a straight street right. and a straight and narrow path. And he says, uh, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul rose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. Suddenly Paul's been blinded. Here's the man that is the most feared and the most powerful man as far as Christians are concerned, as far as God-fearing people are concerned. This is the most dangerous and the most feared man and the most powerful man in all Judea. Here's a man who, uh, over, I think it's in the 26th chapter, is given a commission from the high priest. And that's the only time that word commission ever appears in the scripture, by the way. So if you want to know what the great commission was, the great commission was that Paul was given that by the high priest to go after Christians and, and murder them and bring them back and, and put them in jail and, and make them blaspheme. <clears throat> and he, uh, he would threaten them with their lives and, and, and drag them out of their homes. So here's a man who is, who is the most powerful man in all Judea, uh, in all of Jerusalem, in all of uh, Israel, as far as Christians are concerned, and he's suddenly brought down to a state where he's nothing, <clears throat> where he has to have help even leaving this road from Damascus. He has to have somebody guide him because he doesn't know if there's a ditch on the left or the right. He can't get back on, on uh, a horse. He has to be guided all the way in uh, to Damascus and taken to a, a place where the Lord had, had uh, led him. And Saul rose from the earth, and when his eyes were open, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight. Neither did he eat nor drink. Paul had come into this situation powerful and alive <clears throat> and and suddenly, he's in a condition where for three days and three nights, it's dark. He's alone. He's not moving because you're not. <clears throat> if you're blind and cannot see and you're in total darkness, you're not going to be getting up, banging into furniture, trying to find your way out. He lied <clears throat> in, in a type, um, if you will, for three days and three nights in, in a little grave uh, of his own making where... For probably for the first time in his life, he prayed and truly prayed and saw the depravity of his own soul and saw the things that he had done that had brought him to the state where he was now. And he was three days without sight, neither did eat nor drink. And there was a certain disciple of Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth, and hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him, that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias, <coughs> Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. 
and he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. I don't know. I've never had a vision uh, like that. I've never had the Lord speak to me that directly and that clearly, but I can't imagine that Ananias is going to argue with the Lord like he does here, where he says, I'm gonna, you want to send me to the most dangerous man in Israel? I don't want to go. You don't know, Lord. You don't understand. You don't, you don't, well, the Lord does know. The Lord right. does understand. The Lord does know that he's sending him into a place. There. He says, but the Lord said unto him, go thy way, for he's a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Ananias, <clears throat> Ananias went his way and <clears throat> entered into the house and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, <clears throat> you know, we get, uh, we get told an awful lot that on the road to Damascus that the Lord changed his name from Saul to Paul, but that's not the case. There's a, there's a scripture that says uh, Saul, who's also called Paul, he had a Hebrew name of Saul. He had a Greek name, uh, being Greek born in, in the city of Tarsus. He had a Greek name of Paul. So his name wasn't changed there, but he was also called Paul. He says, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, has sent me that thou might receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. Now, we understand that baptism is an answer of a good conscience toward God. Paul didn't have a good conscience toward God at this time. Paul had been murdering uh, or being responsible for the death of Christians. He had been putting down churches. He had been causing havoc. He had been blast, uh, forcing people to blaspheme. But he did have an answer that the conscience that was put in him in the new birth was given of God. And for that reason, he arose and was obedient and was baptized. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Uh, meat that Paul received uh, certainly had not eating for three days and three nights. He, he needed physical strength, but more importantly, he needed the meat of the gospel and some understanding. And we know that Paul left this shortly after he uh, appeared to the, the saints in Damascus and spoke to them and convinced them that, that he, there had been a change in his life, that he went off into the backside of the desert for three and a half or three years and to be taught of the Lord before appearing. He had a reputation that had to be lived down. And a lot of us <clears throat> are the same way in our pattern. When we come to a knowledge of understanding of what the Lord has done for us and how we've been translated from that death and trespasses and sins into the kingdom of his dear son, and we're trying to walk on a, on a path, uh, we can't immediately turn to our friends and family and say, you know what happened to me? You know how everything's uh, bright and different now. Sometimes we've got a little bit of a reputation that we've got to live down. We've got some things in our past that, that we want to let people forget, if possible, so that we don't sully our reputation as we try to walk for God. And immediately there fell from his eyes, uh, I'm sorry, and straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is this not he that destroyed them which call on, on this name in Jerusalem? And came hither for that intent, that he might bring them bound unto the chief priest. But Saul increased the more in strength, and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is the very Christ. I go back very quickly to where I started in uh, in First Timothy. When Paul had given his pedigree, as it were, uh, his his pedigree as a a sinner and his pedigree is an enemy of Christ where he says who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief and the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief I always thought you know, if Paul can claim the position of chief, then I want the assistant chief. Yeah. But but that's not what he says there. He says, it's a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. He's a, <clears throat> He says, I'm the chief of sinners. Well, I can claim that too. I, I'm the chief of sinners. Of, it's a, a, a saying that's worthy of acceptation of all. Albeit for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first Christ Jesus might show forth all longsuffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Now unto the king, 
eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God to honor and glory, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. He ends his situation and his description of his pattern, giving all glory and praise to God. Now, I wanted to give you one little thing to think about before I step out of the way. And over in, in Galatians, I think it's in the... Uh, in the first chapter of the book of Galatians, um, it's beginning with verse 15. It says, But when it pleased God, this is Paul speaking, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Now, if I'm going to tell you that, that I've got a motorcycle back here behind this podium, and in a few minutes I'm going to reveal it to you, I have to have a motorcycle back here before I can reveal it to you. So when Paul says that would it please the Lord who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, his son had to already be there before that revelation could have taken place. I don't solve the mystery for you this morning. You may come away uh, uh, firmly convinced one way or the other that uh, Paul was born again on the road to Damascus, but I do want you to look at the apostle this morning as a pattern for the new birth and the way that God works in your life. I appreciate your kind of uh, attention. I continue to beg a word of sovereign grace, a ministry of Paradise Primitive Baptist Church in Arlington, Texas. Paradise Primitive Baptist Church is located at 5300 Mansfield Road in Arlington, Texas. Services begin at 1030 each Sunday morning. Plan to come and worship with us. To find out more about Paradise Primitive Baptist Church, visit www.paradisepbc.org. Be sure to visit our website for articles, video, and audio sermons, as well as biblical answers to your questions. Thanks for watching, and be sure to join us again next week. May God richly bless you.